All right, hello, Algebra. Uh, I just want to first say thank you for watching this video. Um, I explained what the video is for in class, but in case you missed it or you weren't in class or something like that, um, I just want to re-explain what the video is intended for. Whenever I'm grading tests, it's very difficult to write out a bunch of words and to be able to convey what I'm trying to say. Um, I still did that if it was kind of a specific problem uh, to, to your test, if, if, if you did something that was kind of, uh, you know, unique because you happen to have subtracted two and you should have added two. Well, not, not everybody made that specific mistake, so, so I'll, I'll make those specific notes. But some things are more general, and so I wanted to make this video because I would love to sit down with everybody and go over their test and, um, and talk about the things that they missed and uh, misunderstandings that they had and that kind of thing. Uh, it would even be great to do that in class, but uh, it just becomes a, a time issue. Um, and it's certainly time that I'm willing to put in. I would love to take that time, but the time that we have in class is a special kind of time, um, and we have to make the most of it that we can. Um, and and part of that is covering new stuff. And, and I feel we take um, two hours, or not two hours, two full class days dedicated to test time. Um, and and I know you guys have said that you want more, you, you want to go over it, and so that's what this test, uh, this video is attempting to do. Um, and I'm just going to go over the topics that are in the test. If uh, you feel like the connection isn't made between the comment in this video and the specific problem you're having, then please come and see me and ask me to clarify it. It certainly is my goal to make it clear, but... Uh, if you need clarification, please come and see me. Um, and I guess before we start, last thing is if you, obviously if you have comment number eight, you don't wanna watch comments one through seven um, if they're not relevant, if you've got those things down. So down below the video in the comments um, are links to each comment. So it'll be comment number one, link to that time in the video where that gets covered and so on. Um, so I guess we'll just get started. So comment number one is about x-intercepts. Right. Um, and yeah, I gave you an equation and asked you to find the x-intercept of the graph. So um, one thing is, if I give you an equation like this, this is an equation, and there is a graph to represent this equation. Okay, And how does a graph represent an equation? Well, an equation is all about solutions. This equation has an infinite number of solutions. You can plug in absolutely any x you want. Absolutely any number can go in for x that you want. And then you can figure out what y would be. And, and vice versa, you can plug in absolutely any y you want and figure out what x would have to be, right? And whatever that x and y combination is, that's a solution, OK? And you log that one away, that's a solution. And then you do another one, that's another solution. And soon you get lots and lots of solutions, OK? So. Um, for something like this, we're trying to figure out what the x-intercept is. Okay, so that has to do with the graph, and we got to relate the graph and the equation. Okay, I'm going to put a little squiggly here because I realize that I'm about to draw a graph that, that is not exactly the graph of this equation. I don't want to confuse you. I'm just going to draw a general graph. I'm just going to draw a line. Okay, uh, the graph of this equation, the, the this collection of all the points that are the x and y's that can be plugged into this equation and have it be true. Um, uh, it, it looks something like this. So what's the x-intercept? So the x-intercept is just a point on the x-axis. That's the important part. The x-intercept is a point on the x-axis. Okay. And since we're calling the x-intercept, it's got the specific definition. Um, then what do we know about it, and how can we use it to, f to use it to uh, that knowledge in this equation to find that x-intercept, that place on the x-axis? Well, we don't know a lot about this this point. Um, it looks like it's in the negative region, um, but that's all we know about it, right? Um, and again, this is not necessarily the x-intercept for this equation. It's just used to to teach about the concept. So. Uh, we don't know what the x is really, but we do know if it's on the x-axis, it has a y of zero, right? This y uh, part of the coordinate for any point is a measurement from the x-axis, and this is zero away from the x-axis. It's on the x-axis. Okay, so if um, 
If y is 0 for an x-intercept, then we can just come over here to the equation and say, OK, so y is going to be 0. So what would x have to be so that I still wind up getting 12? So 3x equals 12. So x equals 4 if we divide by 3 on both sides. OK, so there we have it. What do we have? We have an x that will give us a y of 0. And if we were to plot it on a graph, uh, it would be on the x-axis, right? We could test this out. x is 4. So 3 times 4 plus 4y equals 12. Um, let's see what y would have to be, right? So this is 12 plus 4y equals 12. We'll subtract 12 on both sides. We get 4y equals 0. We'll divide by 4, and y is 0, right? So if x is 4, then y has to be 0. And so this combination of x is 4 and y is 0 is a point on the x-axis. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 0, there it is, OK? Um, so that's an x-intercept. Um, so on to comment number 2, y-intercepts. So as you could guess, very, very similar thing. Um, so unlike an x-intercept, a y-intercept is a point on the y-axis. There it is right there. OK. Well, clearly y is not 0. y is something, in, in this case, the way I've drawn it, makes it look like it's uh, some positive number. Right, so I don't really know what the y is. But similar to an x-intercept, x is 0. The distance from the y-axis, away from the y-axis, which is the measurement of x, is 0. There's no distance away from the y-axis here. OK. So if we were to take um, 2x plus 7y equals 14, right? really simple equation here. Um, we want to find the y-intercept. And this goes, it doesn't matter how this equation is written. Uh, it can be written this way, a slope-intercept form, or whatever. Um, if x is 0, if x is 0, we're saying this is the x part of the coordinate. We're just assuming that it's 0. Now we're going to figure out what y would have to be. Okay, So plus 7y equals 14. 7y equals 14. y would have to be 2. Okay, So now we know what this value would have to be. It would have to be 2. Okay, We can test it out. We can say, well, y is 2. So let's verify this to ourselves. 2x plus 7 times 2 for y. 2x uh, plus, uh, plus 14 equals 14. We'll subtract 14 on both sides. 2x equals 0. x equals 0. So 0 comma 2, just like we have written over here. So this is the place on the y-axis where the graph crosses uh, the y-axis. OK, so uh, on a, another kind of problem where it wasn't just find the y-intercept, it was graphing, and uh, I was asking you to find and label the x and y-intercepts. So let's use this as an example. We've got 2x plus 7y equals 14. There's our original equation. Say I was asking you to graph this and to label the x and y-intercepts. Now you could graph this any way you want. I didn't specify how it was you were supposed to graph this. So you could put it in, in slope-intercept form, if you're familiar with that, and graph it, and it would be graphed. But I still wanted you to label the x and y-intercepts. Um, so you've seen how to, to find the x and y-intercepts, if so you've watched comments 1 and 2. And uh, so let's find the x-intercept for this one, because we have the y-intercept here. So we'll find the x-intercept. Uh, well, the x-intercept means that y must be 0. So 2x equals 14, and x must be 7. Okay, That means that if x is 7, y is 0, of course. So if we have the x and y-intercepts, uh, we have two points, and two points is the minimum that you need to draw a line. So 0, 2. 0, 2, right, that's that point, and 7, 0, right there, that's this point right here. Uh, and we can just draw a line through those two points. And what do we have? We have the graph that represents this equation. And by just drawing lines from these coordinates to these points, I have labeled the x and y intercepts, right? You just say uh, x intercept and y intercept. And done. Okay. Um, so one other thing about uh, comment two. Now, if you have a circle around your comment two, I, I did that on purpose. It's to distinguish it from. Um, I don't know. Just I want you to know that I'm talking specifically to you about this situation. Um, 
So some saw these instructions like this. Find the y-intercept. Find the y-intercept uh, for, I'm just going to make up another equation, uh, 5x plus 3y equals 15. Okay, And um, what you did could be used to find the y-intercept, uh, but then again, that's not exactly what I was looking for. Okay, So what you did was put it into slope-intercept form. So I want to talk about the difference between a y-intercept and the slope-intercept form. So I'm just going to put this in a cloud by itself off to the side. Slope-intercept form. Okay, so like I've already said, the y-intercept is a point on the y-axis. So it's a point. It's, uh, you know, it has like a numerical value. The slope intercept form, right? Well, form is whenever I hear forms, uh, I hear transformers, right? They, they change. Form is just the way they look, right? All their pieces are still there. Uh, they just moved them around, but they're still made up with the same stuff. So the form is just how the equation looks. The equation looks different now when it's in slope intercept form, okay? So if we're going to put it in slope-intercept form, uh, we're going to get y by itself. So if we subtract 5x on both sides, we get 3y equals negative 5x plus 15. That's how I like to write it. Then we're going to divide by 3 on both sides. Okay, divide by 3. So we got y by itself, and now we have negative 5 thirds x plus 5. That's slope-intercept form. Now, we still have not said what the y-intercept is, but if we remember... Uh, this right here is the slope. This right here is the y-intercept. So we could uh, use this slope-intercept form to say, ah, the y-intercept is 0, 0,5, right? And this is being real strict. If you said y is 5, that's all right. If you said 5, that's all right. Um, but this is, this is technically the y-intercept because the y-intercept is a point, right? It's a point. And a point has an x and a y. So... There we are. The y-intercept is 0, 0,5. Um, a little bit of a, a common misunderstanding of the directions to say, find the y-intercept, you put it in slope-intercept form, could have said, look right there, it's the y-intercept. But I need that stated. If you just say this, then it shows me you don't quite get what the y-intercept is and you know, what's, being, uh, what's being asked there. And now we'll go on to comment number three. Okay, So comment number three is about graphing. Uh, using slope-intercept form. Okay, so we're going to talk about that right away. Though I want to talk to those with circles around there. That's just that circle is just to let you know I'm talking specifically to you because um, I really wanted to you know just call this out. Um, okay, so remember that in Slope-intercept form, we're looking at y equals mx plus b. This is the slope. This is the y-intercept. So for those of you with the circles around them, I'm specific, you know, that, that I felt that just that amount of information would have been helpful for you. Um, mostly you got an equation into slope-intercept form and forgot, hey, this is real simple. This is the slope. This is the y-intercept. And all the information you needed was in those two right there. Okay, but it's obviously useful for us if we're going to be graphing using slope-intercept form. Okay, so graphing using slope-intercept form. I'm going to start with a, a fairly simple example. 4 thirds x minus 3. Okay, I am going to real quickly just graph this using slope-intercept form. Um, just because I know that people get anxious sometimes and, and just want to be like, just tell me what I'm supposed to do. Um, I really, I, I even more than encourage you, I'm saying don't just watch this, watch the whole thing, okay? But what do we do? If, if we have um, this equation, what do we have? The y-intercept here and the slope here. So the y-intercept, again, is the place on the y-axis where the graph is going to cross, okay? So it's going to cross the y-axis at negative 3, so we use that as the starting point. And what is the slope? It's the rise over the run. Okay, so we go up one, two, three, four, because that's the rise, 
right? I'm one, two, three, four. And then over one, two, three, that's that's up four because it's positive four. And to the right three because it's positive three. So we put a point there and we connect the two. Okay? Alright. Now the reason why I'm going to go on further and uh, what, what some ha have called overteach it is because um, if I don't overteach it, you won't be thinking about the concepts. You'll be thinking, okay, what are the steps that are memorized to do? And if you build your whole thing on memorization, um, just try to imagine you, what, you, what you're doing by trying to memorize this is memorize it an entire year's worth of information by the time you're done, and that's just going to get to be too much. But if you understand the concept, you're like, oh, the y-intercept, uh, you know, I, I get that. The slope, I get that. Um, you know, it can go in a different part of your brain that um, can handle all this a lot better. So anyway, let me go on. Okay, so let's start with a real, real simple one. 3x plus 2. Okay, so um, let's talk about why this is the y-intercept. Not just because you memorized that it is, why it is, and why this is the slope. I'm using air quotes as I say that. The slope. Why is that the slope? Okay, so first of all, why is this the y-intercept? Well, uh, if you watched comment number two, then you know this already, but uh, if you didn't, it means that you should know this already. So uh, for the y-intercept, that's the point that the, uh, the, the graph crosses the y-axis, which means that x is zero, right? So if x were zero, right, if, if we always write our, our equations as y equals mx plus b, we could always just put a zero right there. And what do we get when x is zero? Whatever this number is. Because this just goes away. y is by itself. This is gone. And y is just equal to that. So if you put in a zero for x, we'll always get this for y. Right? So there you go. That's why that's the y-intercept. It's the y-intercept. So I, I emphasize that because some are graphing it as the x-intercept. Right? They remembered it was an intercept, but they remembered the wrong thing. Okay. Um, so there's just tons of different ways. Uh, that you could remember that, but uh, one of them is that x is 0, and um, that eliminates this term. If x is 0, we're on the y-axis, so y is 2. That's where the line is going to cross the, the y-axis. Okay, so how about this being the slope? Okay, so remember that this graph um, is a picture, it's a picture of all the solutions to this equation, meaning that if I put in something for x and get out something for y, that should, when I put in that x and y, make this equation true. Okay, and that's what we call a solution, right? One of them we just found was zero comma two. That's a solution, so we put a point there. Okay, what's another solution? Well, we can just put anything we want in for x. So let's put in one for x. So we put in one. Uh, one times three is three plus two is five. Okay, so I just uh, went over to x is one. I went from x is zero to x is one. And I go up to 5. Notice I just go up 3 from here. Up 3. Okay. Let's go to 2. Where are we going to get it to? So 2 times 3 is 6, plus 2 is 8. So we go over to x is 2, and I go up to 8. Well, notice I go from 5 to 6, 7, 8. That's just up 3 from that last y value. Right. Let's even go to negative 1. Negative 1. 3 times negative 1 is negative 3. Negative 3 plus 2 is negative 1. Negative 1, negative 1. Okay, so I go from x is 0 to x is negative 1. And I go down to negative 1. Notice that's 1, 2, 3 down from this y value. Okay, so what we call the slope is just really, I, I like to make up stories about the, the history of math. And, and so maybe one day some guy wrote the equation of a line in this way and noticed, how nice. Uh, this immediately, I can always deduce that this is the point on the y-axis where the graph is going to cross, where the line's going to cross. And, uh, and this number right here, if I move over 1, I'm just moving up that much more from the previous y value, right? OK. So let's get into um, another example. Thirds x minus four. Okay, so so from our previous experience, we know that hey, at negative four, I'm going to cross the y-axis. That's my y-intercept. Okay, great. Um, well, what about this? Um, 
Uh, certainly, the same pattern applies as, as did here. If I move over 1, then I should move up. It's positive, right? I should move up up uh, a, an amount of 5 thirds. Well, that's kind of weird. And I move over 1, and I go up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 thirds. That's really hard to, to convey that I'm at 5 thirds uh, up here, like that I'm at negative 2 and a third and not at negative 2. You see that? You can just barely see my pen moving between those two values. So that's why instead of going to 1, we go over to 3. Why? Because let's see it happen. 5 thirds times 3 minus 4. When I multiply these two together, and if you need a reminder, multiplying fractions, adding fractions, come and see me. Ask me about that. Um, but here I could view this as 3 over 1. 3 divided by 3 is 1. So I just get 5 minus 4. So when I put in x is 3, when I put that in there, look what happens. I get this 5 minus 4. Not, not 5 thirds minus 4, which is like, you know, not as easy as 5 minus 4. So y equals 1. So that was simple, right? Um, so if I go over to 3, I get this nice whole number. Very nice. So 5 minus 4 uh, is 1, so I go over to 3 comma 1. And we just found this point, right? this solution, really, that we can translate to a point on the graph. And I can graph this guy right here. Okay. And one more example, because there's one quick thing that I wanted to talk about with negative slopes. Just a quick note, negative 3 fifths x minus 7. Okay, we know again this is a y-intercept. It's going to cross the y-axis at negative 7. And uh, now we have a negative slope. So um, there may be several different reasons why you may not have gotten the slope correct on this. Um, uh, several people with slope flipped it over, so the rise and the run got switched, or any number of things. But one thing I wanted to to uh, talk about specifically was a negative slope. A negative slope is it's a negative number, it's a negative fraction, right? And whether I take negative 3 divided by 5 or 3 divided by negative 5, these are both just a negative 3 fifths, right? So when I think of it as rise over run, whether the rise is negative or the run is negative, just one of them needs to be negative, okay? So if I go, um, let's use this one. Let's take the run to be negative. Right? So the, the rise then is positive, 1, 2, 3. And then the run is negative, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 to the left. So up, 1, 2, 3, to the left, 5. And there we go. There's our uh, another point that we can use to draw a line. Let's think of it this way. The rise is negative, and the run is positive. So 1, 2, 3, and to the right, 5. Well, that's not going to make any difference as far as what the, the line looks like, right? It still is this slant going from top left to bottom right. Okay, So remember, the slope is rise over run. Um, and if you have a negative slope, that means that either the rise or the run needs to be negative, but only one of them needs to be negative. OK, so on to comment number four. Direct variation. Direct variation. What is direct variation? That was actually a question on the test. What is the definition of direct variation and what is the constant of variation? Okay. Um, so, what is the definition of direct variation? It's a very simple thing. Um, obviously, in any equation, there's going to be variation. If I plug in an x value, that's going to change what the y value is. If I plug in a 0 for x, I get 2 for y. If I plug in a 1 for x, I get 5 for y. There's variation, there's change. Okay, um, But in this case, it's not directly related to what's happening to x, because there's also this other thing we're adding to. Right? So um, I, I probably can't explain the, the use of the word direct in a way that'll make it just like, wah, just unlock it and make it so clear to you. Um, but if you think about it, um, one way to think about it is that uh, being that this, and this is, I'm, I'm answering the question here, what is direct variation? This is direct variation. If you just wrote this as the definition of direct variation, you got it. 
that is the definition, right? And you can think of the word direct being used. Sometimes in, in math, the words that we use don't always fit our everyday use of that word, okay? Sometimes because those words are very old, and math is very old, um, and words mean different things now than they did back then, or whatever. Um, but here we can think y varies directly with x, right? As x gets bigger, y is going to get bigger. And not only that, but um, it's just going to be directly related to x. There's nothing else here. There's just x times a number gives you y, OK? Um, I don't expect you to have a big, long definition like that. What is direct variation? y is equal to a times x. y is related to x in this way, that x times some number, and not plus a number, not minus a number, not anything else. But x times a number, and this number could be a fraction, it could be any number, x times a number gives you y. Okay, So um, this guy right here is a number. It is a constant, a constant number. Okay, And it's the thing that tells uh, y how to vary. right? As x goes up or down or whatever, it has to be multiplied by a. So a is the thing that controls how y varies. So constant of variation. Right. So if this is your answer to what's the definition of direct variation and what is the constant of variation, this is it. Just y equals a times x, that's the equation that, that is direct variation. And just point an arrow at a and say, that's the constant of variation right there. That's a perfect answer. Okay. So that's it for that part. Okay. And I didn't say this before, but that part right there about direct variation and the definition specifically is um, is for those of you with a circle around the the four. So um, you know if you if you didn't catch all that and, and you got a circle around the four, maybe go back and watch that again. Okay, but it's very simple. What's the direct variation? Well, it means that y varies directly with x by this equation. Y equals a times x, and a is this thing we call the constant variation. Okay, so if I tell you that y and x vary directly, or that v and h vary very directly, or that any two things vary directly, it just means this equation is true for them. So if um, the distance a car travels varies directly with its speed, that can sound confusing, but um, it doesn't have to be confusing. The distance a car travels. Okay, so this is a obviously a value of some kind, a number. The distance a car travels, we could call that d. The distance a car travels, we could call that d. Uh, directly, it varies directly with its speed. Speed is also a value. We could call it s, right? So d, we could say, varies directly with uh, s, right? Wait, I guess we could put the little thing around it. its, so s. So d varies directly with s. So d is equal to some number times s. Okay. Um, so that that's all we know so far. Okay. But if I tell you that, uh, uh, so a car traveling at forty miles per hour. Uh, is uh, yeah. uh, traveling at 40 miles per hour has gone, uh, let's see, 120 miles. Okay. Then I could ask a question about like another car, right? So, uh, how far? has a, I gotta move this down here, has a car traveled uh, going 30 miles per hour. Right. Well, a car traveling 40 miles per hour has gone 120 miles. Well, that's its distance right there, distance. And this is its speed. So 120 miles can be found by taking this number, a, 
and multiplying it by 40. Okay, just filling it in. So we divide by 40 on both sides, and we find that a is 3. Okay, And we don't have to read into it, but we could read into it a little bit. And it's apparently this is three hours worth of travel has taken this car 120 miles at 40 miles an hour. So how far has a car gone that's going 30 miles an hour? Well, since A is the constant of variation, we can assume that Ed has been traveling for three, mi three hours at 30 miles an hour. And that should give us how far it's gone, right? So 90 miles, OK? So if these two things vary directly, then we can write this equation. All right. And if we're given one example of, uh, of two values for D and S, then we can find A, and then we can use A to uh, find another value. Right? And if I were asked, for instance, to uh, write an equation that relates S and D, then I can write D is always going to be equal to, right? that's a lot of words that's just related to this symbol, D is always going to be uh, equal to 3 times the speed. Okay. Um, and so if I give you, I've given you that example that I enabled you to find three, so then you can always take some other example, some other speed, plug it in, find the distance. Likewise, we could be given a distance, plug that in, find the speed. Um, but that's the way this example goes. Uh, so that's direct variation. And if you can always remember that it comes back to this, the definition of direct variation, y is equal to a times x. That that's a lot to know what the equation looks like that relates to two variables uh, is really important. And <coughs> pardon me, uh, that can just knowing that alone, just writing that down, and and, and even if we didn't know anything else, uh, just working through it, that could lead us to the solution. Okay, that's really whether or not you use specifically this kind of, quote, math, which I would call arithmetic, right, um, in a, your everyday life, that skill of, well, I know this, but I don't know anything else, but I do know this. So what does this mean? Well, if this is true, then this is true, right? I can get from point A to point B to point C to point D. I can follow this trail of logic, okay, with just at one starting point, okay? That's how you can approach this problem. Well, I don't know anything else, but I do know that the distance varies directly with the speed. So I do know that distance is equal to some constant times the variable speed. OK, so if I know that, well, then look at this. I know that the, uh, the speed uh, for, what, for one car is 40 miles per hour, and the distance was 120. So I can plug those in, and oh, look at that. I could, I could find A. OK, well, that tells me what A is. That tells me the constant of variation. So I have, oh, look at that. I have part A. I have uh, the equation. And then what else do I know? Well, I know that another car is going 30 miles per hour, and I know that 3 is always the same. It's the constant of variation. So what if I take 3 times 30? Uh, then that gives me 90. That must be how far a car has traveled uh, at 30 miles an hour. OK, great. And, and I found it. Um, and that's worth a whole lot more to you than being able to memorize what you're supposed to do for every problem on a test or in a chapter or whatever. Okay, So those are the kinds of things that, that I really, really want you to learn. Um, okay, So that should do it for number four. All right, so that brings us to example number five. Okay, uh, Domain and range. All right, so as I said, at the beginning of the video, uh, I'm not so much concentrated on uh, here's how to do every problem. Uh, if you were watching the previous comment, uh, what's more valuable is that you know the defin definitions of things and you can follow a trail of logic. So what's domain and range? Uh, well, first we have to have a function to have domain and range, at least in math we do. Okay, A function, what is a function? Uh, things go into a function, right? We, uh, and we can draw a little factory that I like to use for functions. We put things into a function, we get things out of a function. Typically, we put in x's and we get out y's. That's pretty uh, standard for functions. Okay, well, we could put lots of different things in for x. We could put in, who knows what this function does, but in math, a lot of times it's we put in 1 and 2 and 3 and 
four and two point three or that's not that two. Two point three, three point seven. There's lots of numbers that we can put in for x, and then there's also a lot of things we can get out for x. Or out for y, out as a result of x. Uh, maybe one, two, three, seven, twelve, like whatever we can get out. Um, there's lots of different things. So this group of things we call the domain. This group of things we call the range. All right. So if I specifically give you a graph of some kind, like uh, this, ooh, uh, just all over the place. Okay. Well, what's the domain and what's the range? Well, where do we find x's? We find them on the x-axis, right? These are the things. These are the valid inputs. Okay. Is this a valid input? No. Why is it not a valid input? Because it doesn't have an output. Right? It's not relevant to this function. This function does not take this as input. We know that because it doesn't have an output. We go up here, we don't see any function here, there's no function down here, right? nothing here. So there's, that is not part of the domain. So the domain starts wherever we start to find output. So there is the beginning of the domain. And oh, yeah, we're getting function here, 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 here. And we don't have any function over here. So this must be the end of the valid inputs. All right? This is the domain right here, from here to there. OK, so whatever those numbers are, maybe this is uh, 12 and this is 35. So the domain is anything from 12 to 35. And, and this was stated in a lot of different ways. OK, um, the very official, very math way to say this is that here is the domain. Um, 12 is the smallest number, and it only gets bigger from there. Right? It could be 12, it could be equal to 12. That's why we have this little guy right here. And uh, x takes on the value of the input. So x needs to be bigger than uh, or equal to 12. If it's less than 12, it's no good. It's not in the domain. Okay, So it needs to be bigger than 12. But don't get too big, because 35 is the biggest it could be, so it also needs to be less than or equal to 35. Okay, So there you go. That's a, that's a pretty mathy way of saying it. But if you said 12-35, OK, that's fine. If you said from 12 to 35 in words, that was fine. Um, OK, the range. The range is very similar to the domain. It's just all the set of outputs. So um, one thing with the, the range that some people get confused about is they look just at the little end points, right? They just look from here to there, right? That's that's not what we're looking for. Though those are valid outputs, look at all these other outputs. There's outputs up here above this thing. There's some right there. There's one way up there. Here's an output way down here, right? So it's all of the, the possible outputs, okay? So we got outputs here. We got outputs all along here. But oh, there's no outputs down here. So here's the smallest output. Here's the biggest output. So whatever these outputs are, they make up the range from here to there. And typically, we go from the smallest thing to the biggest thing. Um, so if this is 100, and this is uh, 30,000, then the range, well, 100 is the smallest, right? And y takes on the value of the output. So we'll put y there. So y needs to be bigger than 100 or equal to 100. But it can't be too big because it does have a limit on it. It can only be as big as 30,000. OK. Great, there we go. There's the domain and range. Here, let's, uh, just, just for the heck of it, here's a, a x and y axis. Here's a graph. And we'll put little arrows on this graph, which means what? It goes on forever in both directions, right? So let's talk about the domain and range here. So w contrasting this problem, it has like a beginning and an end for its domain. But how about this one? Like, yeah, we, we could draw a little tick mark there. But does it stop there? No, it keeps going forever and ever and ever. Where does it stop? It never stops, right? We could, we could go forever in this direction and always go way down here and find the graph, right? Find an output for that input. So. Uh, the domain just goes on forever in one direction and also goes forever in the other direction. So the domain for this one would be actually from negative infinity. Right? Uh, this is, this is even kind of silly. It's, it's actually a, a, uh, an interval. It goes from negative infinity uh, 
let's just say negative infinity to positive infinity. I could, I could write something else here, and I don't, I don't want to confuse you. So negative infinity to positive infinity. What about the range? Well, the range, doesn't it do the same thing? You can go down here forever and always find the graph. You can go up here forever and always find the graph. That does not look like an arrow. You can go up forever and find a graph. So it also goes from negative infinity to infinity. OK, just a side note. Um, so now, just one quick note for those that have a circle around the, the 5 there. Um, some of you are confusing the range. And it's unfortunate that in math, a lot of time, I don't want to say a lot of times, but there are times when we use the same word to mean different things. So here's the confusion. Let's say, <clears throat> in this case, the range. Like, you remember that the range has something to do with the output. And what you are confusing is the range as the set of all outputs, which is what the range is here. And the range, when we're talking about statistics and data and that kind of thing, when you look at a set of data, the range is, well, like how, how big is the set of data? How far does it go? Um, how, how big a gap does it span, right? And so you do something like 30,000 minus 100. So you get 29,900. And so you just say, that's the range. It goes that much. There's a span of 29,900. And that's not the range. Uh, not the range when it comes to functions. Okay. So I apologize on behalf of math that sometimes the same word is used to mean different things. Uh, but that's what I wanted to address there, just that little bit of uh, confusion. Okay. Um, Whatever you do, when you state the domain and the range, just make sure it's clear. Uh, like I said before, um, here this is clear. This is clear. Um, what's not clear, sometimes people, like for this, put like 12. Uh, well, I guess, yeah, that it's, some of this is true. 12 is less than 35, but it's never equal to 35. Um, it's a little confusing, or maybe this will be flipped around, and then it's absolutely not true. 12 is never bigger than 35. You're not conveying here that you understand. You're not conveying uh, clear information. Um, what we want to say is that the values that you can put into the function can range from 12 to 35. And the values that you can get out of the function range from 100 to 30,000. Okay, so, and I realize I just used the word range to talk about both of these. And now I'm using the definition of range that we use in everyday life. So um, just got to be aware of your context and the words that you're using. OK. So on to number six. And that is about function, function, notation. notation. What's function notation? Really quickly and not completely put. It's f of x. When we write f of x, we're talking about function notation. OK. So let's work out an example to talk about this concept. Because um, examples are the best way to do this. Because it's, it's really about a language here that we want to develop. Um, what does this mean? Okay. This is the function named f. And this is its input. It's a function of x. When we say something a function of something else, um, it means that the, the one thing, this input, affects the output. Right? So um, you know the I, I'm not a meteorologist, but uh, you know the temperature outside I know has something to do with the uh, the the pressure of the uh, of the air around you, and so. Uh, temperature is a function of air pressure. Or um, let's talk about air pressure again and how it affects your um, your gas mileage. Gas mileage is a function of air pressure. Um, uh, or gas mileage is a function of the gook in your engine, right? The amount of gook in your uh, you know where your where your spark plugs go. Um, it could be all, all sorts of things. One thing is affected by another. Okay, and in the case of math, y is affected by x, right? So this right here, really, this whole thing could be viewed as y, right? But instead of just saying y, we're, we're putting a lot more information in there. We're giving it a name. We're telling you what the input is, and we're also giving it a way to talk about the function and what we might want to do with it. 
Okay, so let's use the example of f of x equals 3x plus 11. Okay, so I want to talk mainly about the difference between f of, let me see what I wanted to use here, 23, f of 23 and f of x, let's write this over here, that's not an f, f of x is 23, okay? A lot of confusion between these two things, okay? Most of the time, people do this, okay? Even when they're told to do this, they do this. All right, let's talk about what this means. You can see that I have taken the x, this x right here, and I've replaced it with 23, okay? So um, what does that mean? I'm replaced, I've replaced x with 23. What am I going to do? I'm going to replace x with 23. Wherever there's an x here, I'm going to replace it with 23. 3 times 23 plus 11. Okay, so 3 times 23 is 72. No, so that's not going to be right at all. What am I thinking? Um, oh, 72. It's not 72. Um, oh, 69, I think. Yeah, that's right. Just doing this in my head. Okay, so 3 times 23 is definitely 69. Okay, uh, plus 11 is, so what, 80? Okay, so it's 80. Um, so there it is. My, that is f of 23. That is f of 23. Okay, and some of you, when told to do this, did this and did it correctly and got 80 and all that kind of stuff, but that's not what this means, right? And we'll talk about that in a second. For one thing, what I want you to know is you are done. You are done at this stage. That's, I'm going to talk to those people with circles around their number, their number six. You are done. You need to be done. Sometimes knowing you're done is uh, the hardest thing to realize in math. Okay. So what happens next for some of you with the circles around the sixes is then you divide by 23, or you do some kind of variation of this, and you get f is 80 over 23. Okay. I I know it's confusing because it looks like f times 23, and it looks like f is the only letter left, and you're always you just your brain says get letters by themselves and figure out what the letters are worth. Okay, but really, if I could get you to do anything, even if you never understood another equation in your life, if you could just think when you do something, when you do something, if you could just think, why am I doing this? What does this mean? Does this make any sense, right? Um, and for one thing, if you say to yourself, well, none of this makes any sense, I just know that I'm supposed to divide by 23 and all like that, that's just, you know, that's a result of having memorized so many things that you, you have neglected to understand what you're doing, right? Um, and I know memorization and tricks and shortcuts are really attractive, um, but ultimately they just leave you feeling like none of this makes any sense. Um, and I, I have to have shortcuts. You don't have to have shortcuts, okay? Anyway, I'm going to stop ranting. F is not a letter that needs to be gotten by itself, right? We're not trying to figure out what f is. Like I said, f is just the name of the function, and x is the input, okay? So getting f by itself, not what you're supposed to do. This just means, okay, let's just put what this means. I'm gonna put a little bubble right here. So this whole thing is, is it's saying a lot of stuff right here. Um, so in the function, the function with the name of f. When you input 23, what is the output? Right? A lot of stuff is said right there. The function f, when you input 23, what do you get? When, it, when you put 23 in the parentheses like this next to f, what it's, what it's saying is all of this. The function called f, when you put in 23, what's the output? That's the whole thing that it's asking. Okay. <coughs> so this thing that I put in a box, f of 23, means the same thing. What's the output? And then you answer that question. 80. 80 is the output. Okay. Now, for this guy over here, 
what does this mean? Well, you can see why 23 now gets plugged in for x, because x is replaced with 23. So I replace x with 23. Notice x, <coughs> x is not being replaced with 23. 23 is the, and I don't really like using this word, but everybody likes using it, the quote answer, OK? OK, or the output. Output is a word I like more. 23 is the output. That's what you get. That's the result. Um, and what we don't know is x. What is x? What would x have to be to get an output of 23? So what do we do? Well, we knew 3x plus 11 is the function. We know we want to get an output of 23. Whatever we put in for x, we want to get 23 out. So now look at that. All we need to do is solve for x. Okay. So we'll subtract 11 on both sides. And 3x equals uh, 14, or equals, uh, equals uh, 12. 14. Subtracting 9. We divide by 3x is 4. x is 4. OK. So there's the difference. Here, what's the output when you put in an input of 23? Here, what's the input to get an output of 23? OK. Um, let's see. Mm -hmm. Right. OK. So let's move on to number 7, which is about uh, writing or rewriting in slope intercept form. Okay. So there's not any one problem that this uh, relates back to. I, I may have put it on. There is one that just says write this in slope intercept form. There are other ones that, that just say um, you know do something, and maybe you decided to write it in slope intercept form. Um, We've done many examples of rewriting in, in slope intercept form, and here we're just going to do some more. And they'll be here forever, um, probably at least for as long as we're in high school. And uh, you can always go back and reference them, right? So they'll be here for you. We'll just do uh, a few examples of rewriting in slope intercept form with negatives and fractions and all that kind of stuff. For the first example, let's start here. Um, so remember the slope intercept form is y equals mx plus b. So just, I would say there's two things here to like check for to see. Am I in slope intercept form? First of all, do I have y by itself? When I say y by itself, I mean 1 times y, not 4 times y, not 7 times y. 1 times y equals mx plus b. OK, so on the other side, here's the other check, mx plus b, not um, a number times x plus b over another number, like some huge fraction, but a number times x. Okay, all by itself, all here, plus another number or minus another number. Right? We can say plus a negative, and so it would be saying minus. There we are. If we have 1 times y equals a number times x plus another number or minus another number, there we are. Okay. So first, get y by itself. What would we do? We subtract 4x on both sides. 7y equals negative. Plus 12. Just like if you were trying to actually solve for y and this were some number. If this were, if this were 12, or no, that's already 12. If this were 35 plus 7y, you would subtract 35 on both sides. So why wouldn't you subtract 4x on both sides, right? Just trying to cancel this guy out and get rid of it and then uh, do the same thing the other side, right? Do the same thing to both sides. Um, most of you doing just fine at that, doing the same thing to both sides. Very important, okay? All right. So here's where some of you stop, and you don't want to stop there. Uh, you want to um, hold on. Yeah. you want to make sure that you um, uh, get y by itself. So how do we do that? All right, here we go. Here's how we do that. We divide by seven on both sides. On both sides. So y is equal to. Okay. So th this is a tricky thing right here. Um, what we have is, is we want 1 7th of this, OK? And as I've said before, division distributes just like multiplication. So we need to distribute the division to both of these things. So we need negative 4x divided by 7 plus 12 divided by 7. OK, let's not try and figure out what decimal this is. Let's just be fine with it being fraction. OK, 12 sevenths. OK, 12 sevenths. And this guy right here, we want to write it as m. Uh, mx, right? A number times x. Okay. Well, negative four uh, x over seven is the same as negative four over seven times x. Okay. Because if you think about it, you, you could take x over one and multiply these back together, and you'd have negative four x over seven. Okay. 
the negative 4 7 x, that clearly shows us here is the slope, right? So that's, that's one example of getting an equation in slope-intercept form, okay? And if we were asked what, what's the slope and what's the, um, what's the y-intercept, then there's the slope and there's the y-intercept, okay? We could also, we don't have to do that. If I was asked what's the slope and what's the y-intercept, well, the y-intercept is when x is equal to 0, and I can plug that in there. Um, but specifically, this, this comment is supposed to be about getting into the slope-intercept form. Some struggles out there, so I just wanted to go over some practice problems. So um, what's another one? Here's another one. Again, let's get y by itself. Get y by itself. Get y by itself. All right, so we're going to subtract 5x on both sides. Let's start there. Let's not think about how crazy this looks with fractions. Let's just subtract 5x to start with. So 7 ninths y by itself now equals negative 5x plus 14, just because we like to write the x's first. Okay, now how to get rid of the 7 ninths? Well, here we divided by 7. Here we can divide by 7 ninths, absolutely. All right, now if we divide this by, by 7 ninths, that's very confusing, that's weird. Divide by 7 ninths, how do you divide by 7 ninths? In fact, we never divide by 7 ninths, do we? We always multiply by the reciprocal. So instead of dividing by 7 ninths, we multiply by 9 sevenths. Okay, uh, so now if you need help remembering how to multiply fractions by numbers or by other fractions, come and see me, okay? Or I can make a video about it if, if you think that would be good. Um, but here I'm going to assume that you know how to multiply fractions. So 9 sevenths times negative 5, right, this is canceled out now. Um, so negative 5 times 9 sevenths is going to be, this is like negative 5 over 1, so we're going to get negative 45 over 7 times x. Great. Uh, and now we get uh, 9 sevenths times 14. So we could just do 9 times 14 divided by 7. Or here, let's just write down an extra step here. No harm in that. Well, 14 divided by 7 is 2. So that's a lot easier. Now the 7 is going to be canceled out. It's just a 1. So now we have whatever this is over 1 divided by 1. Okay. 45 over 7 times x plus 2 times 9 is 18. Okay, great. Uh, let's just uh, maybe throw in some more negatives and some more fractions. Let's just get as crazy as possible. So um, 12 7 x, let's see, negative 12 7 x minus uh, 15 uh, 11 y equals 14 thirds. Yeah, that works. OK, just throwing all sorts of uh, stuff in there, trying to make it as difficult as I could possibly make it. Um, so we're going to get y by itself. Let's take it one step at a time. What can we do to cancel this out? We can add 12 7 x. This is a negative 12 7 x. You add 12 7 x to that, and you must get 0. So we'll add 12 7 x to this side. Um, now, we want to get rid of this negative 15 elevenths, so we'll divide by negative 15 elevenths, or you know what, we're going to wind up multiplying by the reciprocal of 15 elevenths anyway. So let's multiply this by negative 11 fifteenths. Of course, negative times negative is positive. 15 divides 15, 11 divides 11, we get 1 times y. And on this side, we need to multiply by negative 11 fifteenths. And we multiply straight across here. Just keep in mind, you should really cross cancel if possible. So uh, I can see that 12 and 15 have a common uh, common factor. So I'll just go ahead and write this for you. 12 over 7 times negative 11 over 15 times x. And we'll just go ahead and let's see. Uh, the, none of these are going to share any factor. So we'll just go uh, 14 times negative 11. So we should actually back up here and do negative, because it's going to come out to be negative when we distribute this to there. We already distributed it to there. Okay, so we're going to get negative 154 over, this is 3 times 15, so this is uh, 45. Okay, doesn't get any better than that, because 14 and 15 don't share any factors. 3 and 11 don't share any factors. Obviously, 14 and 3, 11 and 15, none of those share any factors. So then if we multiply all that stuff together, none of these two numbers are going to have any factors in common, right? So here we go. 12 and 15, though, they do have common factors of 3, so this is 4, and this is 5, 7, 11, both prime. 
that's not, not going to work. So uh, we're good. So 4 times negative 11, we're going to get negative 44. 7 times 5 is 35. A little bit more work, but it's the same thing, right? We, we did exactly the same kind of thing every time. Uh, so there we are. There's a few examples of writing in slope-intercept form. Let me look at my notes here. Um, just make sure that, uh, especially when you're, you're in a situation like this, that you don't just divide this by 7, or don't just divide this by 7. You have to divide the whole thing. So now, if you go back, I said that the, the division distributes just like multiplication does. You're going to divide everything by 7. Okay. Um, and I'll just I'll leave it at that. Um, so on to comment number eight. Um, so we're talking about solutions. We're talking about uh, points on a graph. Um, let's see. Okay. So. If you have an equation, and you could be asked several different questions, but you could at least be asked two different sounding questions that are really the same question. So uh, let's talk about solutions. Solutions to an equation. Well, points on a graph, they're the same thing. They're the same thing. Because if you think about a graph, is is just a bunch of points, right? If you really get technical about it, a graph isn't even a line. It's not a parabola. It's not a squiggly curve. It's actually just a bunch of points, right? We only draw the line and we draw the squiggly graph because we don't have time to draw all of the points, okay? So we kind of rush it and we draw this line. It's actually just a bunch of points. What are these points? They're solutions to the equation, right? How do we do that? Because the graph is 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 written on a or drawn on the x y plane, and this represents the x value. This represents the y value. We put put a point right there. That tells us that this x value goes to that y value. If you plug in this x value, you'll get that y value from whatever equation you have. Okay. So I'm really emphasizing that because uh, where you are supposed to find solutions to the equation. Okay, that was a four-part question. It said find the solutions to the equation. There's a lot of guessing, a lot of guessing, okay? Uh, if you listen to me now, and you, if you don't understand it, go back and listen to it again and again and again. This is something I've said over and over and over. And if you understand this one thing, it makes your life so much easier, so much easier, okay? So what's a solution to an equation? Please hear me out. Please listen to this. What is the solution to an equation, okay? Real simple. An equation in one variable. What's the solution? It's the number that goes in for x that makes the equation true. Now, in the case of one variable equations, there's only one possible solution. There's only one value that's going to make this true. 3. 3. The number 3 is the solution to this equation. That's it. OK? Solution. Makes the equation true. But if we do 5x plus 3y equals 15, now it becomes a different story because um, if I plug in 3 for x, well, let's see, if I plug in 3 for x, this might not come out so nicely, but let's see. Um, so, uh, well, it'll kind of come out nicely. Uh, if x is 3, then, well, this is 15 plus 3y equals 15. We subtract 15 on both sides, and we get 0, and y would have to be 0, okay? So that works. x can be 3, as long as y is 0. Or we could say it this way, 3, 0. But can we let x be 1? 5 times 1 plus 3y equals 15. So uh, this is 5 plus 3y equals 15. Subtract 5 on both sides, 3y equals 10. y would have to be 10 thirds. OK? So, um, so, uh, if x is, what, 1, then y has to be 10 thirds. Now, both of these values, if you plug them for x and y, make the equation true also. So we have two solutions, not just one. 
Um, and we could keep putting in different things for x and finding all these different things for y. You could plug in different things for y and find out different things for x. So there's all these infinite number of solutions. Okay, let me go crazy. Let me put uh, 2x plus uh, 3y plus 4z equals 20. Uh, well, well, that's kind of nuts. Uh, let's see, we could do uh, t 2 times 1 plus, I don't know, let's do 2 times, uh, let's see, uh, what are we going to do here? Now, yeah, we'll just do 2 times 1 plus 3 times 2 plus 4z equals 20. Well, this is now 2 plus 6 plus 4z equals 20. Uh, this is going to be 8 plus 4z equals 20. Uh, and then 4z equals 12. That worked out nicely because z is now 3. Okay, there's one solution. If x is 1 and y is 2 and z is 3, that's a solution. It makes the equation true, right? If we put in 1, 2, and 3, uh, we would have it. Um, if we plug in 2, 3, let's see what will happen. I'll plug in 2 times 2 uh, plus 2 times 2 plus, we're putting 3 for uh, y, uh, 3 times 3 plus 4z equals 20. We got 4 plus 9 plus 4z equals 20. We got 13 plus 4z equals 20. Uh, if we subtract 13 on both sides, we're going to get 4z equals 7, so z equals 7 fourths. So there we go again. There's another solution. Okay, It's any values that you plug into these variables that makes the equation true. That's what a solution is. That's what a solution is. Okay, So if I wanted to test the solution to see if it'll work, then I would just need to see, does it make the equation true? That's all I have to do. Okay, so if I told you for this green guy here, oh, so if we're gonna reference anything, yeah, let's make this one uh, orange so that we're not confused. So let's go to this green one here. If I told you for instance that negative five, uh, six is a solution to this equation, then what do you have to do? You have to test that solution. You have to see if I plug this into here for x and for y, does it make it true? Let's see. Okay, so negative, so 5 times negative, uh, oh, let's see, I got that backwards. Um, I want it to work, so I, I got that backwards. So 6, negative 5, if that's the solution. Okay, so 5 times 6 uh, plus 3 times negative 15, or negative uh, 5. Wow, I'm really, it's a little early in the morning, sorry. 15, does it equal 15? Does this come out to be 15? Is this equation true? 30 minus 15 equals 15. Is that, yeah, 30 minus 15 is 15. So yeah, it is a solution, okay? On the other hand, I hope this doesn't work because I'm just making it up. One, two, is one, two a solution? Let's see, well, five times one plus three times two, does that equal 15? Five plus six, no, that's 11, not 15. Right, so you can put a line through that equal sign to say not equal. All right. Well, what if I wanted to make up, uh, make up a, a solution? Well, I did that earlier. What did I do? I, I paused the recording. I thought about it for a second. What did I do? I, I just said, well, I'll plug in the next value, and then I'll figure out what the y value would have to be. And then I just said, hey, there's the x and the y value that work. And when you test it, it comes out to be true. Right. So how would we do that? Let's see. Okay, so let's uh, let's say we plug something in for x. Let's say we plug in like a nine. Okay, and uh, then we'll just figure out what y would have to be. We'll work our way backwards, and then we'll erase our work. So uh, five times nine plus three y equals fifteen. So this is forty-five plus three y equals fifteen. Uh, so you subtract forty-five on both sides. So that's uh, negative thirty. So three y equals negative thirty. Y equals negative 10. All right, so we know that y would have to be negative 10. And then we can just erase all this work and say, this is a solution. How do I know? Because, I, well, I just tested it out. I know that if x is 9, then y is negative 10. 
And if you want to try it yourself, I put net 9 and negative 10 there. We got 45 minus 30. That's 15. Okay. Uh, if you want to <coughs> invent a non-solution, uh, we can just take the solution. We know it has to be y, so we can just say 9. Anything other than negative 10 will not work. So 9, 5, right? Not a solution. That's not going to come out to work. Um, yeah. So, or... Uh, we could say 6 negative 5, that's a solution, so 6 negative 4 is not a solution. 6 negative 12 is not a solution. 6 0 is not a solution. Right? So anything that does not come out to work in this equation, it's not a solution. All right? um, it, I realized the question had fractions in it and stuff, but it, they're just fractions. It's, it's not that scary. Uh, the other thing that maybe some of you needed a reminder about was how to add and subtract fractions, maybe multiply fractions. Come and see me. Let, let's talk about that uh, if you need help with that. Um, let's see my notes for number eight here. Um, yeah, that's good. Okay, so, so to just take everything I just said, and if I say find, uh, a, find a point that's on the graph or determine if it is a point on the graph or so on, it's just the exact same thing, right? Points on the graph are solutions to the equation. So if I ask you for it, if it's a solution or if I ask you if it's a point on the graph, it's the same question, okay? So if I want to know if it's a point on the graph, if I give you a point, plug it into the equation. If that does not work, then it should not be a point because the definition of a point is that it is a solution, okay? All right. And we go into more of that with number nine uh, about graphs. Uh, just graphs, graphing graphs. Um, so this most has to do with a, a question where I ask you to fill in a table and then graph it. Okay, so um, if we have a table, looks like this, x, and then here I give you y is equal to 3 halves x plus 2 or something like that, and I ask you to plug in values like 1, 0, 1, 2. Um, so the really big thing here that I want you to see, really big. So this is, I put a circle around uh, this, I'm specifically talking to you guys with circles around the number nine here. Um, really just, um, I know, I, I get the feeling, I, don't, I guess I don't know it, but I get the feeling that uh, there's a, this, this gut reaction to definitions and technical stuff in math, just be like, ugh, forget that. I'll just listen to what I have to do. What do I have to do? And uh, we'll get to that. If you just blank out and, and just keep listening to this comment um, and watching me, you'll see what you're supposed to do. But um, again, you're just going to be relying on the memory part of your brain, not a very powerful part of your brain, uh, not as powerful as the part that understands, synthesizes, processes information. So let's work on that. So if I ask you to draw a graph. The graph is a picture of all the solutions to the equation. Okay? And if you go back to the, the previous comment, comment number eight, I talk about how the solutions to an equation and the points on a graph are the same thing. Um, so if I were to graph, graph this equation, I'm just graphing all the solutions to this equation, all the x's and y's that I can plug into the equation that make the equation true. Okay. Um, try as hard as you want to to not understand that and, and to get around that and to shortcut that. That's fine, but it's oof, it's so much more work to work through math without that understanding than if you were to have that understanding. So uh, the graph is just all the solutions to this equation. Okay. Um, let's pick a, an easy one. I, I can tell that two is going to be a fairly simple one to do. Okay. Uh, so one solution, I'll just tell you, one solution is going to be 2 comma 5. One solution is going to be 2 comma 5. It, or the exact same thing, uh, an exact equivalent statement would be that a point on the graph of this equation is 2 comma 5. Why? Because 2, when you plug it in for x, gives you a y of 5. Okay? Or if I plug in 2 for x and, y, uh, and 5 for y, 
it'll come, <coughs> come out to be true, I'll show you. Put in 5 for y. 3 halves times 2 plus 2. 3 halves times 2 comes out to be 3. 3 plus 2, what do we get? 5. So 5 equals 5. So this is a true statement. So 2, 5 is a point on the graph because 2 for x and 5 for y is a solution to this equation. Okay. And if I plug in 2 for x, I get 5 for y. Right? I just said the same thing at least three different ways. Okay. Uh, okay. So we're going to finish this table off. Let's start with negative 2. y is equal to 3 halves times negative 2 plus 2. So negative 2, it's, you know, negative 2 divided by 2 is negative 1. So it's 3 times negative 1. So you get negative 3 plus 2 is negative 1. So negative 2 put in for x gives us a y of negative 1. Negative 1. Got all that scratch work here. 3 halves times negative 1 plus 2. That's negative 3 halves plus 2. That's negative 3 halves plus 4 halves equals 1 half. 1 half. 0, that's easy. Put 0 in for x. 0 times 3 halves. Just do that in your head right there. 0 times 3 halves is 0 plus 2. We just get 2. Oh, the y intercept. Oh, wow. Okay. And 1. Uh, that's going to be. 3 halves times 1 is 3 halves plus 2. That's 3 halves plus 4 halves. Getting a common denominator there. 7 halves, 7 halves. OK, so let's fill this all in. Negative 2, negative 1. I'm trying to draw this to scale here. Uh, negative 1, 1 half. Ready? Uh, 1, 7 halves. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 halves. There we go, and let's uh, draw that line. Okay. Um, so the connection that I really wanted you to see here is that all of these, right here, these, all of these, are solutions to this equation. All of them are solutions to this equation. Because if I put in this x and this y into the equation, it makes the equation true. And since these are solutions, they should be points on the graph because that's what a graph is. It's not a coincidence. That's the only reason why graphs were invented was to draw solutions, to, to get a picture of the solutions to an equation. Okay? When we draw a picture of these solutions, an interesting thing happens. We get a straight line. Neat. Okay? So we just get this simple up and over kind of behavior. Okay? Um, so that's what I really wanted you to see. Solutions are points on the graph. Points in the graph are solutions to the equation. All right. So that is number nine. Brings us lastly, I think. Let's see. Um, okay. Number ten. Yeah. Number ten is the last one. Uh, this has to do with parallel lines. Okay, let me just say really quickly before I explain it: parallel lines have the same slope. Okay, that that is one very simple thing we could say about parallel lines. There's a lots of different things we could say. They don't touch and, and all these different things. But one thing that's really relevant to where we are in our, in our mathematical growth is that they have the same slope. Um, and that has to be true. Parallel lines have to have the same slope. So if I were to ask you, are these two lines parallel, all you have to do is tell me, do they have the same slope? So if I say that um, 5x minus 2y equals 14 and um, y equals 5 halves x minus uh, 12, right? Are these two lines parallel? It's hard to say right now, but we know that they have to have the same slope. So if we can know the slope of both of the, uh, uh, these lines, uh, if we were to graph these and turn them into lines, would they have the same slope? Then we would know they would have to be parallel, okay? So this one's already in slope-intercept form, so we can see the slope is 5 halves. So if this one has a slope of 5 halves, they're parallel. And if it doesn't, they're not. Okay. 
So find the slope of this uh, of this graph. Um, well, how do we find the slope of this graph? Lots of different ways. Uh, at least two different ways that I can think of. Um, we could find two solutions, two points on the graph, and find the slope between those two. Okay. Uh, we could put it in slope-intercept form, and there's the slope right there. Um, and and nobody tried finding two points, uh, and that's very understandable. Um, most of you tried to put it in slope-intercept form. So that's just another example of putting it in slope-intercept form. Divide by negative 2 on both sides. Remember to divide both of these things by negative 2. Y equals... Well, negative divided by negative is positive, so 5 halves, positive 5 halves times x, uh, minus, because that's 14, divided by negative 2, minus 7. So, yes, they have the same slope, so they are parallel. If this were anything else than 5 halves, then they wouldn't be parallel, okay? So if I gave you options between different lines, find the one that has the same slope. That is the only way. If you just graph them, like, if I were to graph two lines... Are these two lines parallel? First of all, they're not even lines, right? For lots of different reasons. One reason is uh, they're squiggly because I'm not a very good line drawer. Even if I got the line tool, let me get the line tool, and I draw some real nice lines. What are you doing? Oh, I have a white line. It's very hard to see white. OK, do that. Not only do that, do that. I mean, I could draw another line and make it look real, real close. Uh, but. It, it might not be right. So I can even just take this and make a copy of it and put it right there. Are those two lines parallel? Again, they're not even really lines. Uh, it's a pretty good argument to say they're, they're parallel. They represent parallel lines. But you know, what I'm trying to make a statement of here is that drawing a graph, you're not very good at it. Neither am I. Neither is anybody. You cannot draw a really great graph. Well, I guess you can draw a great graph. But you can't draw a perfect graph. Okay, You cannot tell just by looking at these two things, if they're parallel. Even, even if I take this guy right here and put it right on top, and I can see, oh, look, they're, they're like, if I put them on top of each other, they're the same. Yeah, they're, they're parallel. But what if they were off by just a fraction of an inch? Uh, if, if, I, if I took this one and I turned it just, a, just the tiniest amount that I could muster, did I turn it? You, don't, you maybe even don't even know. but. Are they parallel now? Did, did I did I turn it? Did I not? Uh, if it's just a fraction of a of a millimeter of of a, of a hair uh, on the back of a frog, just a, just a tiny bit off, then they're not parallel, right? So your graphs are not good enough. Just to look at these two lines and say oh, they're parallel, okay? It just process of elimination is not enough. It's not enough. You got to know for sure, and to know for sure, they have to have the same slope. All right, so find the same slope. Um, if you need, uh, you know, putting it in slope-intercept form is very helpful. If you need help putting things into slope-intercept form, see example 7. If you need more than that, come and see me. Um, but that's it. That's number 10. That's the last one. And uh, I hope that was helpful. Um, I, I was glad to take the time to, to make this video for you. And, uh, um, yeah, just give me feedback. Uh, this is the format I'm going to use to go over tests. Uh, so that I can give you better feedback, okay? Um, so, yeah, thanks a lot for watching uh, and, and give me some feedback.